welcome back to another episode of Writer's Workshop. So in today's video, I'll actually be reading out a short story that I crafted from the painting we talked about last week, and I just wanted to do that to show you how we can incorporate elements of what we'd already talked about regarding description with color, lighting, and using the five senses to write a really good story. Hopefully what we cover today will help you improve your stories, your technique in world building and storytelling. Let's get into it. So just as a reminder, I'm gonna keep the painting right here next to me so that you guys know exactly what I'm talking about and you can see how I'm trying to bring this image to life in a way with my words. As Black Pablo hobbled down the fern green grass, he could hear the commotion coming from the little wooden shack where the vaquine was to be held. The sounds became increasingly louder and he was horrified at the scene before him when he finally reached the open front door. The house was filled to the brim with people, animals, and food, and the ruckus made it seem much more like a party than a funeral. He made his way into the little home, its white walls losing the radiant shine they once had as the wood ate the paint away. The emerald windows covering the rusted metal underneath were all open, letting in the breeze on that hot summer day. Black Pablo made his way to the makeshift altar, a little coffee table covered with a cotton cloth that Doña Flavia had slaved over to get the lace just right. He was the only one who looked at the little angel. Little sapphire shoes peeked from underneath a mountain of roses that consumed the little body his curls resting on a rose satin pillow. Not even the priest could spare a moment out of respect for the little boy. As he stared greedily at the roasted pork that hung from the ceiling, its greasy head dripping onto the floor and the smell of its seasoning impregnating the air. As little Juanito ran around the room chasing the dogs, Black Pablo turned to see the men getting intoxicated and the couple in the corner whose dance had turned into a feast of passion. Underneath the voices that spread gossip, told jokes, and shared secrets, Pablo could hear the sound of an out-of-tune cuadro playing the dances of his childhood. Returning to the little angel, Pablo pulled a small glass container from his pocket, and after begging the priest for a second of his time, he blessed the water that had come from the creek behind Pablo's shack. Pablo's warm hands froze as they touched the little boy's soft and cold forehead, dust and grease clearing off his skin. Pablo anointed the little boy before he went on his way to his eternal home. He whispered a prayer between himself, the boy, and God. A moment of peace in this oasis of debauchery and disrespect. He soon felt his hands begin to shake, his stomach turning, nauseated by the smell of stale beer and sweat. He felt his face turn scarlet, his eyes darkened, and his voice raised above every sound in the room. Have you no decency? He shouted, all guests turning to him and consequently the little angel for the first time. An innocent life is taken from us and you put on a party. You sit there talking about his mother, condemning his father, but how are you any better? None of you turning to say a prayer or kiss his forehead busy with your drink and coveting the plantain that has entered this house for the first time. You gorge yourself on this feast when you never bothered to spare a grain of rice or a portion of your bread for this child. The room stood in silence, horror, shock, and shame filling the guest's eyes. Pablo awaited no reply. He gathered the longer ends of his cloak and holding his black cane stiffly, walked out. All that could be heard as he made his exit was the clacking of the cane on the wooden floor. And as the sun illuminated him by the door, the guest could have sworn the bandages around his head were actually a halo. There'd been two angels among them that day. Okay, so now let's break down that little story. So I wanna start off with the name of Black Pablo. Um, there are two things. That name I actually took 
because it was the name that the author from the book that I talked about last week that made stories from the painting, that's the name he gave him. But also, I wanted to use that as a way to sort of build the culture. Now, it's a little different when it comes to world building when you are creating a brand new world. Obviously, you get to make up the rules, but you just have to make sure you've established those with your reader. However, when you're writing about a culture, in this case, since the painting is set around this idea of the bakine, which was a funeral for, for children, for black children, um, that, that used to be done in, in Puerto Rico, I wanted to bring in elements that would allow my reader to go into this world. So one of the things that's really common in Puerto Rico and really in Latin America is that people will get nicknames sometimes based on characteristics, which might include maybe somebody who is from a different country. So they might be called like the Turkish one, El Turco, um, or you might have somebody who has red hair. So they know him as El Colorado, the redheaded one. So it really wouldn't be something disrespectful to call this character Black Pablo. It would just be something that, you know, would commonly just be a nickname that would come culturally. And that helps um, to sort of set the scene. And there are other elements, for example, using the term Doña, which is kind of like ma'am or Mrs. Not necessarily, because there could be Doñas who are unmarried. Um, but it's, it's sort of a prefix used out of respect. And they, like I've, I'm struggling right now to come up with an English equivalent. So that's why I used it in Spanish, just to keep that cultural um, implication. Realistically, I would probably put footnotes in cultural elements. You don't have to do that. You are definitely welcome to just leave it as is. And, you know, hopefully your reader will go in and search it. But I... <laughs> I struggle with footnotes sometimes, like when I'm reading something, because I'm like, ugh, they're a little bit disruptive, but I think they're very helpful for, for cultural elements. And I think they're very prevalent in books like A Tale for the Time Being and um, a lot of the Russian novels did them. So that's, that's sort of up to you. So another thing that I wanted to do was show you guys how to be descriptive with color in a different way. We have a tendency to go like, if something is green, it's emerald, right? So I used fern green grass. Um, it's kind of a mouthful, so I'm not sure that I love that choice. But when I was looking at the painting and I looked up sort of color charts, when I was looking through them, fern was always the color that sort of matched that green more. So that might be something that you might find helpful if you haven't thought about it before is going in and looking for color charts and thinking about variations, thinking about exactly what color you want so it's not always, you know, the cliche colors, which are like ruby red, emerald green, um, ivory, onyx, you know what I mean? But I did use the emerald green later for the windows and I talk about um, the cotton cloth, which was good because it gives both touch and color because you can obviously understand that you know, this cotton is, it's probably white, but then the cotton kind of gives you that texture. You know, I was talking about how hard it can be sometimes to include touch, but I think you don't need to necessarily have your character touching things. I think mentioning fabrics or textures is really, really helpful. For example, like when I write about the greasy pig, you can imagine what that would feel like and as well as seeing it. Um, as well with like the, the dust and the grease coming off of the little boy's forehead, you can imagine that as well as like the touch, you know, being it being cold to touch. And then the contrast with the heat coming off of Pablo's body. And that's another thing you can do is use contrasts in like synonyms and antonyms to sort of add to your story and give it texture or give it lighting because it'll help you differentiate. For example, when there's like, at the end, when they're talking about like, oh, the bandages were seen like a halo because the sun was hitting them, but they you couldn't see that inside, that sort of means the room, well, it doesn't mean, but it implies that the room was much darker than the actual day was. So again, that's adding layers, that's using lighting in a really interesting way 
that isn't just kind of like it was the middle of the day. As well, when I talk about the white walls, I talk about how the wood is um, eating away the paint that's losing its radiance. That also, without having to be like, oh, it's this specific shade of white, or like it's like pearl, or because with with shades of white, I noticed when I looked that a lot of the the terms we would normally use, like a lot of the different shades, are terms we'd normally use. And since I wanted to avoid that, then I said that then I instead chose to say that the paint was losing its radiance. That way you can imagine it was a bright white without me having to say it. And then it's kind of like, oh, well now that's kind of muted to maybe an ivory. Then as well, I'm sort of going back to the idea of touch. I'm sorry that I'm like jumping all over the place, but I also talked about the rose satin pillow. So that just like the cotton did the service of giving you both an idea of what it physically looks like, but also what it would feel like to touch it without anybody having to touch the pillow, you know what silk feels like. So find textures that are common and that your reader would be familiar with, and that's really gonna help to add the sense of touch without you necessarily needing to have your character touching every single item, because that wouldn't be very realistic. I think another fun trick that I included in the story was talking about how the music was at a low volume compared to the sound of the room, but instead of saying just like, the music in the room couldn't be heard over the voices. I sort of talked about how, it, yeah, how the music was underneath the voices. And I made sure to add what type of music was being played, which was the danzas, which are um, common, older, uh, traditional music from Puerto Rico, um, as well as adding that it was out of tune. Um, yeah, I was talking about a cuatro. A cuatro is like, it's, it's an instrument that exists in Puerto Rico, it was invented there. Um, originally, it had four strings, that's why it was called cuatro, meaning four. Uh, now it has like, I think it's like five sets of two or something like that. So it does, the name doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, but anyway, I included that, which is, again, very specific to the culture, along with the danzas, but then including that it was out of tune and including that it was kind of at a very low volume sets an atmosphere. It builds ambiance and it also helps to tell the reader what they're supposed to be listening without it being super obvious, without it being like music was low, sound was high. And of course it's always good to include metaphors and similes as a way to build your descriptions and it can help with a lot of things. For example, when I said the oasis of debauchery and disrespect. That's of course describing the scene in itself, but then it goes back to how we were talking about how you can use lighting and different elements to have an emotional context. So you don't have to obviously state things. So the oasis of de like having that moment, again, a contrast of the moment of peace with the prayer versus the debauchery and disrespect with that moment being an oasis, you can sort of, your reader can sort of imagine like all the sound around draining away and it just being this very intimate moment between Pablo and the little boy versus there's like this big dark world outside that it's, it's tainted and it's dark. And then in the middle of the room is this light, bright, peaceful moment that contrasts sharply with everything going around it. All right, guys, well, I think that is all for today. I kind of wanted to actually create a story, both to demonstrate how to use these techniques and also because it is a bit easier for me to explain things with concrete examples. Instead of just being like, you can do this or you can do that and then trying to come up with an example on the fly. It's not always as effective as just having a little story. So I will be including this story. It's going to be posted up on my blog, which you can find down in the description below if you guys want to read it. Um, if you guys want to give this exercise a try, it's it's pretty fun. It's very interesting. Um, so you can find a piece of, of art, a painting, or it can be a song. Maybe next week I will be talking about movement and capturing movement. I think that's that's really incredible and we often sort of overlook it. But for example, when you think about dancing, that's a great moment 
and a great exercise to do, try to describe the, describe the movements of a dance without literally just saying what the moves are, instead just explaining how the arms extend and the legs and pointed toes and that type of stuff. So if you liked it, don't forget to leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe, and I will see you guys next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.